Welcome to Money on Tap. Money on Tap, your personal finance headquarters, where we bring out the professionals' experience and some fun in what we call three-dimensional investing, utilizing insurance, brokerage, and fee-based planning. That's what we do on this show. We look at all sides of the issues, and we bring a fully independent planning perspective to the table. Welcome. You are listening to Money on Tap. My name is Seth Crossman, And I'm Ben Brayshaw. You can reach us at 855 226 8 Five five one. That's eight five five two two six eight five five one. Or info at yourmoneyontap dot com. So if you are returning to Money on Tap, if you're podcasting us and you've got us on uh, what is it, never ending play, <laughs> <laughs> which uh, which does happen every once in a while, you might get stuck in in that zone with us, and you're like, oh my gosh, Ben and Seth all day long, never better. Uh, well, we're glad to have you. That's the point. We're excited about today's show, and if you are if you are a new to Money on Tap listener, I'm going to tell you what to expect. First of all, Ben Brayshaw is like having a New York steak or a porterhouse steak at a really your favorite steakhouse with the <laughs> with with the baked potato and the the asparagus with the hollandaise sauce all there in front of you. That's Ben Brayshaw. Me, I, I I'm Seth Crussman. I'm kind of like the the kale at the Grand Slam, you know, breakfast, that little no, piece of garnish that you You're the look after at. dinner drink, drink, Seth. I mean, come yeah. on. Don't do, <laughs> but you're here's the fine the wine. Here's the key. With it with that Grand Slam breakfast and that piece of kale that if you ever dare to eat makes you look like you just saw a close encounter of the fourth kind on your face. <laughs> you might figure out how to put that in a blender with some apple and some protein shake and open up your own uh, uh, storefront in California and turn that into a mega million dollar franchise and also save your life, folks. So that's where you get that's what you get with me. I'm just going with the after dinner drink or the fine wine, Seth, that goes with a steak. Let's just stick with that one. But uh... you, you're 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 my favorite cut of. <laughs> Wow, wow, this is going to be an interesting show today. You are in a unique moment in your life right now. So, <laughs> well, okay, so we're going to have fun, right? We're going to talk about financial planning. We're going to talk about you. Uh, we're going to talk about markets. We're going to talk about money in the news. You know, Seth, there is a new country in our United States borders. <laughs> As a lot of people have heard of Chaz or Chop or whatever it is. But the unrest because of this has created a lot of headlines across the board. And, you know, we don't really get into too much of the, uh, the political arena that much, but it does impact our financial world from time to time. And, and honestly, it, it's impacted a lot of things in the Seattle area due to that. Well, in our world, a billion dollar investment firm is moving out of Seattle due to the unrest and they're moving to Phoenix, Arizona. Now, what's really interesting about this is that it's not just this firm. There is a, what they're alluding to as some sort of exodus out of Seattle. Um, and it's just giving way to a lot of concerns about Seattle and the long-term viability of them as a business culture because they have been a very kind of cutting-edge business culture. There's The article is uh, it, it's off of KTAR News. Um, Peter Samor, who reported on this, goes into stating that uh, one of the quotes was that 40 story story buildings are rumored to be only 20% occupied by October. And the founder of this Phoenix um, investment firm, this billion dollar investment firm said that even, um, even though they're moving and the cost of moving and all of those costs and that Seattle has lower taxes for them, they're saying that they're just really having trouble finding, you know, candidates or people to recruit to the area even 
just to get qualified individuals to want to be in Seattle right now. And I don't blame them. <laughs> it's just safety. It's concern. It's fear. I mean, there's some real unrest there. And that is a probably something that we need to look at in the investment world. I mean, if you own real estate and you're in real estate holdings, you probably want to know how much is in the Seattle region from an investment perspective, because here's a lot of foreshadowing that's going to happen. And I think other cities and states that are actually going to engage or allow some of this unrest to just, you know, go unchecked, I think is all are also going to suffer some of the, you know, real estate issues that could be right around the corner for them. Yeah. They, the, uh, the quotes there that the biggest concern for the Seattle was that the business, com- uh, what is the business community going to come back to and what kind of businesses are going to be coming back for customers? It's a, it's a legitimate concern. And it's it, the news coming out of the Seattle area around this and rest is, is pretty scary. If you are, if you hold real estate, if you're trying to have a location where you feel like your employees are safe would be a big part of it. Uh, and even though there were some expenses, um, kind of on the front end or even on the tax side for moving into Arizona, I'm just going to go with what kind of weather would you like to have? How would you like to raise your family? Is there anything there that, that speaks to you as an individual that would, I think I would probably like to have the opportunity to, you know, <laughs> go outside and get my kids involved in whatever we want for the day and not have to worry about our things going to start burning down around us. Yeah. And the socioeconomics there, I think, is potentially a, a, a play for them as well. Yeah, they were just talking about the number of people that, you know, will stay versus the ones that won't. And then, you know, what are businesses, what businesses are going to actually stay there? And what is their, what are their clientele going to be? Are, you know, are, is it going to be a bunch of, you know, out of control people who don't want to obey any rules. I mean, is that, is that, do you want to host a business in that region? I mean, in what kind of people are you going to be able to hire? And I think this is a huge, if, if leadership around the country doesn't get a, get a handle on this, it's going to be the, it's going to be the leaders who do have a handle that are going to attract all the businesses. And we're going to have significantly, you know, poorer regions Versus ones that are more wealthy as the businesses flock towards kind of safe havens, as I would call it, because this this article is definitely alluding to a much bigger problem in Seattle than is, in my knowledge, getting reported anywhere online um, or on TV. I mean, I, I hear people talking about the unrest and this, that and the other thing, but the actual business drop and the number. I have a client who works in Seattle and and they're not going back for the rest of the year to work there. And their office location, they said, was a mile from the the Chaz Chop location. And um, they were concerned. They were legitimately concerned. And I I wouldn't blame anybody for that. I'm with you on that. Uh, Moving to article number two. It's Dara Singh that brings us a title, Alarming Number of Boomers Struggle to Save Enough for Retirement. And that's a survey that was bringing to the front some numbers, Right about the median amount that uh, boomers have saved for retirement is around 144000 And that's according to a survey from Transamerica Center for Retirement Studies. That's challenging. When you take a look at a 20 to 30 year retirement ahead, how do you make those numbers work? And this is something we work in and we see all the time uh, with our clients. And, and so yeah, we're we're going to talk about that for a minute. Yeah, I mean, Dara rocks it a little bit here when she just gets into some of the kind of visionary pieces that a lot of people have that aren't spoken about often enough. But, you know, those people who are 65 who are thinking, I'm going to probably work a little longer to make up for what I haven't been able to save, or I'm going to, you know, I'm just going to work till I can't work anymore. Well, what's really interesting is is that just the unemployment rate is so low. The, the 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 capture on you know this kind of the older generation working in these jobs are usually the higher paid people, and they're usually the first ones cut to to do financial savings in companies. So it, it may be that you want to work longer, but you may not be able to have a job longer due to the unemployment scenario that we're dealing with as a country in trying to get through this recovery. And so she brings a really strong point here. And, and if you're listening to this, 
the advice she gives, which is kind of a, a step out in the article, which I thought was unique, um, was that engage in some learning, engage in some development, some personal development inside the workforce. Continue to f- you know further your learning and your whether it's credentials, whether it's you know knowledge base, whether it's ex- you know expanding your abilities. Don't stop because you make yourself more valuable to allow yourself to work longer or at least even maybe move into a consulting role um, with more abilities. I thought that was a, a solid jump out on her part. Yeah, absolutely. Skills are a huge part of what uh, people are looking for as an employer. And, the, you know, the demographic is is one of the one of the pieces that is so hard to ignore where there's a younger population coming behind that is employed at um, – uh, for less, with higher, with more skills, and that's kind of engaging as an opportunity for an employer. So, separating yourself as an as somebody that has the skills, has the knowledge, has the wisdom, all of those factors, and has not necessarily priced themselves out of the market. Great advice. Yeah, and I mean, she makes one note on Social Security, which I think is good to point. I know we've said this before, we've talked about it, but, you know, basically two in five Americans have been surveyed, as she notes here, um, that believe that Social Security will be reduced or eliminated during their retirement years. So two out of five. And and I got to be honest with you, I'm part of the two. I'm part of the two. I, I really do think that Social Security is going to have to get, you know, hatcheted or removed for some people. Um, There's going to be something that has to happen there. I'll say no. (laughs) That's just, you know, to offer a fair and balanced side. You're part of the three. That's okay. That's okay. You can be part of the three. Uh, I feel like that's a losing argument no matter what. So, well, 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 I don't think it's, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen, of course, but I, I think that we need to be a realist, a realist in the fact that there's going to yeah. be, if we don't have some other cost, whether it's taxes rising, the amount of money, if they keep Social Security the same, they've got to raise taxes more. So what do you get to keep, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I thought one of the interesting pieces there was uh, the conversation about an employer-based 401k plan that really wasn't even available until the late 90s. And that was a that's a significant part of their story. Is you know the the um, how did people retire? Yeah, before? is the first generation of the really the first full generation of four hundred one k participants only. You know, people who don't really have pension plans. Yeah, will it be a successful? Was it a successful move or was it a big mm-hmm. sham? You want to talk about the Fed? Yeah, we can talk about the Fed. I mean, sometimes they're relevant, sometimes they're not. <laughs> so, um, article by Callum Kown. That's a good one. The Fed story will win out over the second wave of election fears. Okay, and there's a there's we're we're going to talk about what's pushing the the markets, what's pushing what what are the we major should just talk about right how now. you butchered that poor guy's name. It's Callum oh. Keown. Come on, thank you. You're welcome. Appreciate Sorry, that, Callum. <laughs> My apologies. So UBS says uh, it's time for investors to get off the sidelines. What think ye? You know, Seth, this is an interesting article because um, it goes really very much into our topic today, which, you know, is, you know, average stock market returns and, and what's the history tell us and, you know, how do we move forward and what does the future potentially look like and the pros and the cons. And, you know, what we have here is just kind of an interesting perspective of saying, hey, the market's had some recovery. We're in the midst of like this, you know, huge political thing going on in our country. We've got riots and and craziness, and we've got, you know, we've got COVID potentially round two. We've got all this different stuff, and UBS is saying, hey, pull the money out of your savings account and shove it in the stock market. Um, You know, I'm not against this story. I mean, I'm I'm not on the other side of saying, hey, where are we in a few years? I really think there's a lot of dynamics inside how you invest and where that money goes to, you know, in what they're saying, because they're not really directing anything specific, but they're saying that the central bank, they're, they're starting to buy broad and diversified portfolio. I'm quoting this article here right now of corporate bonds last week, sending stocks higher. You know, 
there there's a whole piece of the banking world now that that the Federal Reserve is buying into the market on one level or another that's that's really going to push the market a lot, I think, in ways that are unfounded. And we have no history behind this because we, as we mentioned before, this is a brand new kind of event. And and they're saying that this may kind of push the market more like a freight train than I think it is, which is kind of interesting. And that's my interpretation, obviously, of this. Yeah. So what is the Fed doing that's pushing the market? And they're being very clear about their their plan and how they're un, unveiling that. Um, how does it, how does it play out? We don't quite know, but the other two pieces there were, you know, the China trade tensions. And then of course the COVID fears and what are going on with the virus, but those being the three main things that are really pushing the market, uh, one direction or the other, as we've seen as of late. Yeah, it's kind of, a, it's definitely a, it's definitely an interesting thing. I mean, it's a, it's a wait and see and, and so forth and buyer beware. I'm, I'm, you know, we're not making a recommendation to throw your money in the market today. Um, especially in certain domains I would definitely would avoid. But that brings us right to um, kind of a fourth article that taps into it, which we it's from Barron's. The stock market is headed for one of the best quarters ever. Time to talk tech bubbles. Um, this is by Ben Levison, and uh, it's really... Fine, you take the easy name. <sighs> so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Both of them were easy, Seth. <laughs> Just easy. The stock market gained again and again and again. They're talking about the the Nasdaq, the S and P. We're rocking and rolling. The market's moving up. Things are happening. We've we've had this enormous you know recovery from the Dow being down in the eighteen thousands. We're in the twenty six range. We're up in the twenty sevens. You know. The market's moving, but the tech bubble potentially that is building here is very, very apparent to this author as an issue that we need to be aware of. And back in the 90s when we had a tech bubble, everything seemed like it couldn't go down. And why should it or why shouldn't it is the uh, is the question of the article. Great question. There's, uh, there's some interesting statistics that really fall in line. Um tech sector basically makes up 27% of the S&P 500, highest since the dot-com bubble. On the other side, the financial stocks are now just 10% of the S&P 500, the smallest since February 20, 2009, when it made up 9.8% of the benchmark. So if you subtract the financial sector waiting from the tech sector, you get 17%, the biggest gap since that dot-com bubble. So does, do all, I mean, do you remember the yield curve reversion? thing that we were talking about uh yeah. oh, eight months ago yeah i do and maybe. that being that indicator so there's there's a case to be made for that coming true right because covid happens the uh, we've got a uh the steepest decline in the market that we've seen since when uh and and, I, and we're talking about that now is basically the 19 um oh gosh when we're we going back to on that we've we've got the the best quarter in the market since the uh, Great Depression, right? That where where there was a drop yeah. in the market, best best return in the market since the Great Depression. So there's one thing does not always equal the other. Is basically the point here. You can't take a look at this. You can't take it in the numbers and say, oh, well, it's always going to be that. Just like we took a look at that um, that yield curve inversion, and that was an indicator that the market was going to go ahead and have either a recession or a depression or a pullback. It happened, but was it because of that? I don't think so. I mean, you can't say that COVID created what the stock market predicted five months prior to that. Make sense? Yeah, it, it does. I mean, it's a little, it's a, it's a probably a little bit over the top uh, uh, for some people listening, but, you know, I mean, when you really break it down, when you're looking at recovery, and we're looking at a at a pandemic scenario that we've never had in our economy in a way that we're viewing it today in kind of the real time that we have it. I mean, literally something happens anywhere in the globe and we know almost immediately on some sort of media device, on a phone that's carried in our pocket or purse, and it makes everything swing at, at drastic numbers. And now we're seeing this enormous recovery. We're seeing, we're not just seeing like, you know, the Dow hasn't hit its all-time high again. 
but we are seeing all-time highs in the NASDAQ. And the the investment side of the tech sector, yeah, that's driving it. And everyone's saying, well, hey, we've got opportunity for stay at home. And is that the way it's going to be? And that means that we need to rock more tech because that's where all the profits are going to be. And that's where people are going to buy because the stock market is usually kind of the thinking of the leading indicator. Like you're leading into it. You're expecting better returns. You're buying into what you believe it's going to be and, and so forth. But is it really going to be that? Is it really going to be that we're all staying at home working and having our groceries shipped in from Amazon? And the restaurants are all closed and we have to all stand six feet apart forever. I just don't think it is. And I don't think with all the the recalls on the numbers of deaths with COVID and the the numbers that are coming out of Stanford University of, you know, and, and the WHO acknowledging it and the CDC is saying that the death toll is way below anything that they had ever fathomed and that the, the, the number of deaths we've reported in this country are not nearly that many. It's it is some huge error. I, I mean... I don't know, Seth. I mean, there's just so much news that everyone's waiting to actually have it come down to the point where I think the election's over and the solid truth and the foundation of it comes out. And I, then I think then I think we can move forward properly, because other than that, between now and then, I think the market's in a major amount of turmoil. As promised, that was Ben Porterhouse, baked potato with all the fixings, Brayshaw, and I'm Seth Kale, garnish at your Grand Slam breakfast at Denny's. Crossman reporting on the news. That's money in the news. Hey, we're going to take a quick break. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. And when we come back, well, we are going to be talking about historical returns in the market and what does that mean and what expectation can you have because, um, you know, there's two different sides of that story, isn't there? And we can't wait to talk more about that with you. You're listening to Money on Tap. Hi, my name is Ben Brayshaw, one of the co-hosts of Money on Tap. If you have questions when it comes to your retirement and are looking for a personalized solution, contact us at Brayshaw Financial Group. In today's volatile stock market, we can help you plan to find your successful retirement solution. Am I saving enough? Am I saving into the right places? Do my investments match my appetite for risk? Do I have a tax strategy that is going to help me keep more of what I earn? How can I maximize my Social Security income? If you are like most people, you are getting closer and closer to your retirement and may be wondering if you're taking the right steps. If you're in retirement, you may be wondering, am I maximizing my income while preserving my estate and caring for my family? We talk about all things financial in what we call three-dimensional investing, putting a plan around your financial future. If you feel that now is the time to start getting the answers to some of these questions for your own situation, give us a call at Brayshaw Financial Group at 855-226-8551. Headquartered in Bedford, New Hampshire, we have offices throughout New England and across the country. We would love the opportunity to show you how we can help. There's absolutely no cost or obligation just to meet with us, and we welcome you to our office. Call us at 855-226-8551. Now back to Money on Tap with Ben and Seth. Welcome back. You're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. Today, folks, we are talking about what can the market do for you? What can the market do for you? Can it... There's, no, there's Seth. There's a number of people listening to this right now saying <laughs> it can do nothing. I do I, everything I buy; it just goes down. I, you know, I just went through the pandemic. I lost twenty, thirty percent of my money. I sold everything out. I'm out of the market. I'm sitting on the side. I mean, there's a there's a million different versions of people who just hate the word the stock market. And if you're a listener today and you're one of those people, we're going to talk a little bit about the market. We're going to talk about returns, average returns. We're going to talk a little bit about, is it right for you too? I mean, what what, and how do you get these returns everyone talks about? Or what are people doing to do that? And I think this is going to be a good show for you. If you've got questions and you're, you're listening to what I just said and you said, hey, I, I just seem to always lose in the market. Give us a call. We can chat with you. We can talk with you. We can figure out you know, what's, what's good for you. 
um, 855-226-8551. But is the, is the market right for everybody? No, it's not. Right, Seth? No, it is not. Right, Michael? <laughs> That's our compliance officer. A little shout out to him. We love Michael. Michael does good work. But you know, you know, Seth, the the average the average return in the market. You hear you hear numbers all over the place. You hear five percent. You hear eight percent. You hear ten. It used to be that people used to say the the market averaged twelve percent. Um, but with the uh, with the last number of recessionary kind of events, we had the nine eleven, the financial crisis. We've had 14, then we had, you know, the pandemic. I mean, we've had all these different pieces moving, and that those things have actually forced us down uh, quite a bit. But the, the market average is spoken to be roughly around 10%, and, and that varies by indice and index and, and how you're invested and, and so forth. Now, people hear those numbers and almost invariably say, you know, that's, that's not what I make. That's not my return. How how is it that you know I can't do those those returns? Or I hear my buddy, I love that racetrack theory. You know, the guy goes to the racetrack, he comes back, tells you about the horse he won on, or the or the stock he always wins. You know, but I never tell you about the five investments or the five horses he bet on that he lost a ton of money on. And that's I call that the racetrack theory. And there's a lot of that that goes on. And um, I think I really want to explore that a lot for a lot of people today who are kind of emotionally kind of cutting through how the market plays into their their life because it it really is a lifeline to what their retirement's going to be. Yeah, at some point in time or another unless you are just not at, at all in the market, which is possible. I mean, people create income in all sorts of different vehicles, but the market predominantly is is the place where the majority of Americans are going for a return. And that's what we're looking for. And that's what we're talking about. And on average, I mean, and on average, you're, you're going to get, on average, you're going to get all sorts of different numbers out there, honestly, that people are going to say this, that, and another will get you X return, right? And, and if they're talking about a market vehicle, they definitely shouldn't be articulating that as a guaranteed. But uh, and, that, and and what we would say and, and the way people want to think about this for the most part is they want to just understand first and foremost, just give me a number that in my head I can work with and I can do a straight line analysis of I put $100,000 in and next year that 7% is going to be $107,000 and then the year after that, that $107,000 is going to compound into that 7% and it goes up from there. But that is not the reality. And that's why you have Warren Buffett that says you can expect from the market over time 7%. But then there's the number of recently that we've been seeing a lot more uh, publication around, which is 10%. That seems to be the number a lot of people talk about in the market. So how could there be such a huge difference? You know that's a great that's a great question and and I think I think that really goes to just looking at the numbers like actual hardcore statistics. You know I I had just googled historical returns and um, I went to dqydj.com and it's uh, it was just a, hold on I, I need to sharpen my pencil for a second. What did you just say? You went to what? I went to dqydj.com. I have no idea what this stands for. I just went to a couple different historical return calculators out there, and you know I just put in what what was the average return for five, ten, twenty, thirty years, and I said, well, what does that look like? And um, it was really kind of very interesting. So um, I'm looking here on this. The first one I ran was the S&P 500 because the S&P 500, it's, you know, it's, it's a much bigger index than the Dow. I mean, the Dow is only the 30 largest U.S. companies. Here you got 500 companies weighted differently, but it's 500 bigger, companies. Bigger, but in terms of history. Less history, less yeah. history, but the same history here at this time period. More so, relevant? Hmm. Well, let, let the let the listener decide. Let the listener oh, decide. Let's, okay. let's let's not make a declaration here on that just yet. So, um, the five year average return was nine point three percent. Okay, the ten year return was nine point two percent. This is the average. The twenty year return was also nine point two, which is a fraction higher, and the thirty year return was nine point four. 
Now, what's interesting about this is, you know, the S&P 500 is just all equities. It's all stocks. Okay, so you're not talking about maybe a blended allocation. You're not talking about a 60-40 or something like that. So so when I hear Warren Buffett speak and I hear about kind of like the 7 or the 6 or whatever return you're you're actually referring to, you know, this return is just a pure equity return with high risk. So what does that mean? Well, if you were to take the same five-year period, I mean, you're, the best return you could have in that first five years would be about 33.6%. I mean, if you had invested in the very lowest and to the very highest in that five-year period, 33%. Now, that's a huge, that's three times, that's more than three times greater than the average. But the minimum return is, is that someone in that same time period, you know, could have lost 17%. That's huge. That's a huge disparity. And that disparity kind of continues through the years, though it does get smaller as time goes on. Because in 10 years, the highest was 21. The lowest was negative 4. Then the 20-year period was the highest was just under eight, just under 18. And then it was a positive 2%. And then the 30-year return was 14% as a high and 3.6% as a low. Again, positive return. So the longer you held you know, your minimum return really started going positive. And it's just really interesting that the average is kind of right on target, but the the maximum minimum return is pretty pretty drastically different. Yeah. It's it's really drastically different. And and it kills a lot of stuff. And then, you know, without getting into median and standard deviation and all the complexity of stuff that us financial advisors instantly go to, I really wanted to break it down to average, max, and min and just say, hey, listen, you have the market averages on the S&P if you just bought in that 9% range, but you could be the unlucky individual that bought at the wrong time that lost money. And, you know... For instance, like where, where who would I have been at what point in time that you're talking about there. Because there, going back to the racetrack and the water cooler, somebody has done this, and we'll get there as well as, you know, what an average ex- investor's experience is in the market and what those returns look like too. Yeah, I mean, there's always one person out there, right? There's always one person that, you know, got in, you know, two months ago when the market was down. And we're going to talk a little mm-hmm. bit about that that personality versus the personality who's selling two months ago or th- two and a half months ago when the market's going down. You know, so there's there's that person, right? So if you were to buy in two, three months ago, your return is phenomenal. And if you, you know, got in five months ago, well, your returns maybe break even with most yeah. kind of scenarios. Uh, or maybe even still underwater because the Dow and, and the S&P are a little underwater still. Um S- so what is the, I mean, the likelihood of something ha- like this happening, right, where you're the average investor, let's say, and 10 years ago, you decide, well, I'm going to put my money into the market. And over that 10-year period of time, you could actually have achieved a negative 4% return. You could have. Yeah. But is that how most investing works? No, no, most investing doesn't work that way, right, Seth? So, I mean, we've got people who are putting money in their 401k and they're constantly doing it. And maybe they're buying, you know, the S&P index, uh, you know, some variable that's offered inside their 401k plan. And they're just, or they're buying, you know, some time-dated fund, which, you know, we completely t- tell people relevantly that that's not really where you should go. But, um, you know, we believe that a, a solid intentional allocation is much better for most most investors, and potentially cheaper fee wise. Um, but I, I mean, yeah, it can happen. But the average investor should be investing on a regular basis, exactly, yes. and they should be you know constantly doing the same amount of money. And then when there are pullbacks in the market, they should be looking for opportunity maybe to even slide more money in and take a little bit of additional advantage when the market drops down. So that would, that would create that ultimately you would have to have in order to do that, you have to have a plan right around what it is and your strategy and how you're investing because in order to save that money to take advantage of pullbacks in the market and be opportunistic that way, that is one of the main things that, that really doesn't get articulated in, in most of the conversations is is that a strategy that does well and works well over time and will that ultimately raise your 
potential average rates of return because you will, if you are investing money, $1,000 a month over a year. Some of those returns are going to come back over that 10-year period of time as you sequence forward at a negative 4 or 5%. Some of those returns are going to come back over a period of time at a 9% and more, right? But if you do have a strategy built in towards saving and looking for the uh, February through April um, uh, pullback in the market and putting more of that money to work at that point in time, could you actualize greater returns? Well, yeah. I mean, that's what I did. I mean, I, I literally, when it was two, three months ago and we, you know, I mean, uh, on the way down, we, with our management, you know, we went to some cash and, um, we actually reallocated it months and months ago. And we've talked about that on the show and we've done reallocation since, and we've actually raised cash in, you know, over the last few weeks, um, successfully to the point where we have a little bit of a cash position. Cause if we do have a pullback, we want to take advantage of that and we'll take, t- you know, small pieces and positions as time goes on and things drop. Um, but yeah, I absolutely did do that. Like two months, three months ago, I was taking cash I had and I invested it in assets because as the market rises, I take profits and those profits need to be retained for new opportunity. And I was waiting for opportunity. I happened to be a little bit more fortunate than some because some people maybe took opportunity a little earlier, but when the pandemic hit, I wasn't, you know, when the, when the pandemic was hitting, I wasn't necessarily selling my blue chips kind of perspective, the, you know, my winners. But I was looking to, you know, cash in on things. I was unsure of how they would perform, and and that's bode well for me. And I think that's a that's a methodology that has existed for or since the time of investing has ever existed. It was to look for those opportunities, and uh, and we'll talk about that. But I I think Seth, when you bring up returns, I want to list a cold hard fact, okay? Because this is really something that a lot of people need to swallow in a way that preps them for retirement because when it comes to retirement there's kind of a there's kind of a switch right there's one day you're working and then there's one day you're not and the day that you're working that's your that's part of your accumulation phase you're accumulating assets and then when you go and you hit the switch for retirement you're going into what we call the distribution phase but in the investment world by no means should your assets be a light switch movement either it should be a progressive intentional planned event that you have long before that you know exactly how to retire well instead of, you know, contacting a financial planner, you know, three days after you retire and say, what do I do now? Um, If if that's your case, yeah, well, that's what you have to do because you can't do that. But if you're approaching that and you're saying, hey, that is in my future, this is the time you really need to start looking at when you're getting a planner to help you retire. But going into, let's go back early 2000, Seth, rewind history. Let's look at January 1st, 2000. Okay, the close on the S and P five hundred. Okay, was thirteen hundred and ninety four. Okay, for all of you listeners, thirteen hundred and ninety four. The the S and P today is trading at three thousand. Okay, but the S and P January first two thousand two zero zero was trading at almost fourteen hundred points. Now, that was the close of that day. If I were to fast forward one decade later. Okay, we're looking at the S and P at the cl- okay, so I have the close on December first, two thousand nine. So nine years, eleven months later, one thousand one hundred and fifteen. That's a negative twenty percent yield. You just lost twenty percent over over a decade. Ouch! That's that's horrendous. That's I mean that's like that's that's horrible, bad, horrible. I mean that is that is as bad as you know it's going to get, and you know like if you were the person going to retire, two thousand ten, and you just lost twenty percent of your money over the last decade, I mean I'm and again I'm not taking into account reinvesting asset well reinvesting dividends but I'm not talking about you know adding more money over those ten years just start to finish, you know it was just a negative twenty percent yield most people did between. Three and five percent in that time period with investing is usually what I saw with most people, um, and actually the uh, it was even worse if you go into January because it dropped another <laughs> dropped another forty points um, on the S and P. But we're talking about a thousand on the S and P five hundred. It's three thousand now. That's a huge increase. 
so that what we're talking about with these averages is really complicated because you're you're in periods of time of major loss and then you're in periods of time of of major success and we've gone through a decade of a great recovery period and now we've gone through something that's unprecedented this pandemic and what's next i mean are we going to go through another decade of recession and complication. I mean, looking at the world around me, I'm not too excited about, you know, the riots or the the potential second coming of COVID and, uh, <laughs> you know, the election cycle. I mean, goodness gracious, this is, this is some scary stuff. And if I'm an individual investor on the sidelines, Seth, I'm scared. I don't know about you, but I'm scared. Yeah. It, it it is pretty darn scary, especially when you're talking about the market at three thousand, and it, I mean, there's plenty of people out here with a getting behind a headline of, well, this looks a lot like two thousand because you know the 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 factors that were there in two thousand are now here again because we're there's the tech bubble and maybe we're in another tech bubble, um, that kind of a that kind of a thinking and. I mean, even if that's not what you're thinking, you could just take a look at, you know, the headlines of the trade trade deal in China or, you know, the COVID second coming headlines. Uh, so what do I do? OK, because we because we're this is the, the, if we're taking a look at an average, I mean, you, you want to get a return somewhere. All right. Average investor A is not the person that inv- that puts it all in, and you know all my chips are in in January one of two thousand. Uh, that's that's not the case, and the average investor today is not saying all my chips are you know I'm, I'm taking all my savings and I'm putting it in the market right now. Average investor is again probably your four hundred one k, putting a uh, a percentage of their paycheck in, getting a match, going into the market over time, but. Coming back to the idea that what is it that we really have on our side? What's the benefit that we have? We have history and we have time. We have time moving forward. And if you are an investor that is looking to take advantage of that, which is, you know, the reality of how investing works is you you have to use time and you have to have a plan and that plan needs to have some consistency, some level of we do this every month like this because we know that over time, this is what the average, the law of averages and the numbers are going to come back to us like. Now, whether it's a 7% or a 9%, okay, we get it. There's a difference there. There's no guarantee and there is the volatility, but you have to have and create a mindset around that and a plan around that to actually Take advantage of what that is. Yeah, you know, that's that's dead on, Seth. Having a plan is what we're all about, and, and it's honestly the way that we find that people have the most success. The uh, Just to jump over to the Dow to give people comparison, I had done the average returns on that as well, and the five-year was a little over 10%. The 10-year was 9.948%, so just under 10. The 20-year was like, almost dead nuts on 10%. And the 30 year was a little over 10, 10% as well. Um, but the drastic, drastic maximum minimums were actually worse than the S and P 500. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that we're only talking about the 30 largest U S companies and you have a lot more volatility, the smaller, the mix of, of, you know, companies you have, because you have a smaller group of averages, you know, the, the more companies you have, the better average, perf- you know, you're going to have and potentially, you know, a little bit more sustainable max and min to keep it a little less. But the five year was, you know, maximum was like 36, almost 37 percent, but the minimum return was like negative 20. <laughs> I mean, it was horrible. So, you know, those are things that people really need to be aware of because, you know, you could be the investor that goes in all well intentioned and be the person buying at the wrong time, putting all your money in. That's why we highly encourage dollar cost averaging, you know, just getting your money in a little bit over time and not just shoving it all in the market and then getting burned. I would say that that's also a case for the models of diversification, too, right? When you're taking a look at over 500 companies and uh, using that as a model of diversification versus 30 of of the largest, then you know, potentially you have a higher return and, and, you know, diversification can work the opposite as well. It can reduce your return over time. If you're, uh, if you're looking at it from that perspective as well, 
so what's your mindset? Are you in a, are you in a hyper aggressive investor? Well, either of these or things, you, Seth, would be hyper aggressive, right? I mean, if you're oh, going to yes, buy the S and P yes. 500 or the Dow components, it's here, all equities. It's yeah, all so equities. that's as aggressive as you can get. And so, when you talk about a diversified portfolio, then all of a sudden people say, "Well, you know, but my yield drops way down. I'm all chasing returns." And you know, you start to look at, "Hey, I I want to do a bond piece in here to reduce my risk. What's next?" You're listening to Money on Tap. We are uh, talking about what can the market do for me and you. So this is your show. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. And uh, we're actually going to talk about you specifically on, in the law of averages as an, as an investor and what you can expect to, to uh, look forward to. The three takeaways we got coming up, Seth, are going to be good for people. Hi, my name is Seth Crussman, partner with Brayshaw Financial Group and one of the co-hosts of Money on Tap. One of the biggest concerns and largest expenses people face today is taxes. Without thoughtful planning, taxes can destroy future retirement dollars, eliminating the possibility of a timely retirement or dreams of what you want retirement to look like. If you're like most people, you're getting closer and closer to retirement, and you may be wondering if you're taking the right steps. Will my income be enough? Will rising taxes force me to give up my dreams? How does inflation factor into all of this? These are real concerns and you're not alone. Putting a plan around your financial future is what we do. If you have questions when it comes to your financial security, and if you're looking for a personalized solution, contact us at Brayshaw Financial Group, 855-226-8551. It's time for you to start getting answers to your questions. Headquartered in Bedford, New Hampshire, Brayshaw Financial has offices across the country. We'd love the opportunity to show you how we can help. There's absolutely no cost or obligation to meet with us. Call us at 855-226-8551. 855-226-8551. Now back to Money on Tap with Ben and Seth. <laughs> Welcome back. You are listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. And we're talking about what can the market do for you. It's out there, folks. The information that we are talking about today is at your fingertips. If you just uh, want to bring your phone up and say google this or google that all of the uh, all of the stats all of the information is readily available or you can just reach out to us and say what in the world where are you getting that information from because it is um it's readily available so what's the market s&p 500 or dow that's what we were just kind of comparing and contrasting talking about a little bit of diversification all of its stocks yeah. in either one of those I think, Seth, if we start jumping into the NASDAQ and all the technology side and the tech bubble, I mean, we talk about, we talk about those returns. It's just astronomically crazy because it's, it's just not an index, you know, that's been, it's only been around for 38 years. And it's, you know, you go back 30 years, it's just the creation of the indexes. I mean, the creation of technology, really. I mean, 40 years ago, Seth, I mean, 40 years ago, we didn't have cell phones, we didn't have cell phones nope. 40 years ago. <laughs> so when you think about that stuff and you think about the creation of the tech, obviously that is just astronomically high. So we, we don't really want to show that out there as a, as, a, as a viable potential index comparison of where you might shove your all your money and, and so forth. So I'm going to leave that out. But, hey, we do have some takeaways that I really want to rock out here because there's a little bit on each one of them. But I wanted to give everybody kind of some ideas because when we talk about the market, um, you know, we, we, we do believe in diversified portfolios. We've obviously been talking about the stock market and why people talk about one percentage versus another. But, but Seth, you wanted to mention the one piece about, you know, what the average investor actually makes in the market. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we've been talking about averages of, you know, 7% and 9% and how many people out there, raise of hands folks are saying, that is not me. I am, I'm, I am not the negative 4% person uh, over the last 10 years, but I am not even close to that 7% or that 9% because that's 
not the reality for the average investor. So if that's you, don't worry. Uh, well, maybe worry, but um, don't think that you're alone, okay? Because there is – here's the reality for most investors. And this is uh, information from Dalbar if you're looking for you know where this is coming from. The average investor over uh, – now, this is a, a – you know, a mutual fund, fixed income, blend of equities type of a portfolio only gets 2.6% net annualized rate of return, okay, for a, a, a 10-year period. You want to take a look at a 20-year period, it comes out to 2.5. 30-year period, 1.9. You want to take a look at uh, the same periods for just bonds, okay, Super much more stable historically, you're looking at 0.6. You're looking at 0.7 for 10 years, or yeah, 0.7 for 10 years, and um, for 20 years, 0.7. Excuse me, that was 0.6 for 10 years, 0.7 for 20 years, and 0.7 for 30 years. Okay, those so, are low. I mean, those are it, horrifically low, Seth. Right. I mean, that's that's not much different. <laughs> Actually, that's. <laughs> You remember, That's far less than if you were to have a high yield savings account. Remember when we were talking about that fidelity manager who was, you know, saying how he had done so well in his fund, but his average, of, like I don't know, it was like, I don't know if it was ten or fifteen, right? something crazy. He had done really, really well compared to the market, and yeah, but his average investor for him was doing like less than a quarter or something than he was because they were buying and selling him, like he was buying and selling the market. And they mm-hmm. kept losing. And he's like, you know, if people just bought and stayed with me and trusted me, I'll get them there. That's his, that was his perspective. That's how he yeah. kind of put it. I thought that yeah. was an interesting thing because we are our worst own enemies. Yeah. So the, the, the report and the information just want to get you up to speed on that as well. Really, that's from Dalbar's quantitative analysis of investor behavior. Okay. So good study out there. Good information. So I want to get that out there to you. Good information. And if anything, this is why Ben and I are talking about this today, because you need to have what? What are the th- the three things that we consider super critical and important to you coming into a strategy around equities or the market? Yeah. And let's let's give them let's give everybody the three takeaways we have here today. And, um, you know, number one, don't get too excited when the market's up. Okay, you know, the market's up, it, it's going to come back down. It, it always does. Um, so, you know, don't get too wrapped into the fact that, hey, the market's up and I need to buy. I need to get into this mess because it's really, really good and I'm, I'm going to miss out. That's number one. Number two, you got to have a long term perspective, right? And with that, just like you don't get excited about the market going on a rip and taking off on you. Have a positive attitude when the market pulls back because if you are an investor and you've got a strategy, you are going to be buying that and you're going to be participating in that. And that's beautiful. You want that. That's the opportunity. Be, be, be optimistic. Optimistic. Number three, the averages only exist because of a buy and hold hold strategy. Now, I, I, I emphasize hold because the thing is, is people are trying to trade in and out of the market constantly to try to beat it a little bit. The truth is, is those averages that we, we would love to all have in our portfolios based on your Dalbar report, um, it, that's because of there's too much activity. There's too much internal trading and, and, and not just buying the market because you believe in it. You gotta, if you want the averages, you got to buy and hold. You have to be consistent on your investing. You have to do regular investments. And there's things like that. you got to do that. Those are our three tips for you. We encourage you to take those away, to utilize those. If you're running around those, those fears of, of underperformance or you're, you're just not like, you're, you're like, the market's not for me. There are other things you can do. We've chatted about those on the show. You can go back to some of our other podcasts, or, but just give us a call at 855-226-8551. We're here to help. Thanks for joining us today. You've been listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. Also, we're in a podcast. 
you can find us at any of the podcast venues out there. We appreciate the likes and the listens. We're also at Facebook at backslash 3D investing and Twitter at BFG underscore LLC. We appreciate you joining us here today and we hope you make it a great day and a great life. Thanks for joining us with Money on Tap. The views expressed are not necessarily the opinion of this radio station and should not be construed directly or indirectly as an offer to buy or sell any securities mentioned herein. Investing is subject to risks, including loss of principal invested. No strategy, product, material, or tool mentioned can assure a profit nor protect against loss. Please note that individual situations can vary. Therefore, the information, products, materials, or tools mentioned should be relied upon when coordinated with individual professional advice. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. This show may be subsidized in whole or in part by a product sponsor or issuer. Securities and advisory services offered through SagePoint Financial Incorporated, member FINRA SIPC, and a registered investment advisor. All other services offered through Brayshaw Financial Group, LLC, are independent of SagePoint Financial. SagePoint Financial and Brayshaw Financial Group do not provide tax or legal advice. Main office is located at 116 South River Road, Bedford, New Hampshire. 03110 and can be reached at toll free 855 226 8551.